Today, I have two things on the agenda. <clears throat> one is to talk about, one is short and one is longer. The longer one will probably extend between today and at least Thursday. <clears throat> All right. The short one is to talk a little bit more about validation. All right, because we've seen the validation controls, and I want you to understand how they really work, and and, and to spend a few more words on validation. And we've seen the validation controls, um, the required field validator, the the range validator, all the different kinds of validation. If we draw our our um, model on the board, where we have the client connected to the internet. That's connected to the server. The server, as servers do, responds to requests. The difference being is that in a client server environment or with server side scripting, the request can contain more than a URL. It can contain other environmental properties and it contain form it can contain form data the server then integrates with the database and it has the scripts which are recipes and it produces a response which is again a response in the way that browsers consume <coughs> What do browsers consume? They consume web pages. What are web pages made up of? They're made up of HTML, <coughs> JavaScript, and CSS. Okay, so these server-side scripts, in our case, they involve the ASPX file, which contains ASP.NET controls, <coughs> and it includes the code-behind files which includes, um, in our case, C-sharp code to manipulate those controls. Now, in the case of a validation control, let's think about how your typical required field validator works. The request comes in for the page. The page contains a required field validator associated with a text box, let's say. What will happen then is the response will include the HTML for the text box, input type equals text. It will also include um, JavaScript to validate that. All right. The reason it delivers the JavaScript to validate it is this JavaScript code can run virtually instantaneously. It's trivial the amount of time that it would take to run the validation on the client side <laughs> because the code and everything is here. Remember, we're talking about in, in, in like computer scales of time. In computer scales of time, the, the, the time it takes to run a snippet of JavaScript here is nothing compared to the time that it takes to go through the internet, go to the server, and come back. So these validation controls run on the client. So you get an instant response. If you notice, and, and we saw examples of it. If you noticed, we um, didn't see any like flickering in the browser. It wasn't like reloading the page. So it happens within the client side code. However, one issue that exists with client side code is it can be turned off. People can go and turn off JavaScript. Now, how many people do it? Probably not that many. All right. These days, I really couldn't imagine navigating through the web. But there's a potential that people could try to circumvent your validation by putting in missing information, or by not putting in some information and try to slip past an order without a credit card or whatever by disabling <coughs> JavaScript. So these ASP.NET validation controls also fire off on the server. They fire on the, off on the client. They fire off on the server. All right. If JavaScript is disabled, then the script running on the server side will catch it and will flag it as an error.
good news is you don't really have to do anything for this to work. That's just the way they work. All right. So it actually redund runs redundantly on the client side and the server side. It runs redundantly if JavaScript is enabled, which, it, which JavaScript is enabled for the vast majority of people. For the small percentage that might have JavaScript disabled, the server will catch it. You lose the benefit of having the immediate response, but hey, at least you catch a potential problem. Other thing to keep in mind is, it's good news for the server too, because if there's missing data, the server can't process the form correctly, so why even present it to it? You know, so the, being able to catch it on the client side is a win-win situation for both the client and the server. But the fact that these controls also run server-side code to do validation is, um, you know, sort of like the safety net in case they do have uh, JavaScript disabled. Now, in addition to that, there can be some more extensive validation that can only run on the server because it's more involved and more complicated and requires more resources. And we may have alluded to this before, but I can do JavaScript validation to make sure, for example, that a credit card number is entered. I can make sure that it's all digits and that doesn't include letters because there's no letters in a credit card number. I can make sure it's the right number of characters. But what I can't do, what the client doesn't have resources to do, is like to check the bank to see if that credit card has been reported stolen. Or that it's a valid credit card and someone didn't get the digits wrong. Or that the credit card is over its limit. Or that the credit card had expired or whatever. All right, That kind of validation requires interacting with perhaps a database or perhaps some other sort of web service to validate your credit card information. And that requires the resources of the server to implement. So to kind of summarize, validation occurs typically on the client and the server. You do get automatically with ASP.NET redundant validation on the client and server just in case the client uh, JavaScript has been um, disabled. And there may be some additional validation on the server side for stuff that can't be validated. Now, I want to take a second simply to um, test um, this theory out, all right, and shows what ha show what happens when you, when, when you disable JavaScript and try to run validation. So let me go and do that <coughs> real quick. starts at 10, 50, at 10.30, but I'm almost sure I said that. That's what Google told me. Google's very seldomly wrong. Right. Very seldomly doesn't mean never. <laughs> All right. Should yeah, exactly. Boy, who would have thought that you'd see this headline, which 0-2 teams can get to and see that picture and to think they're talking about the Saints and not the Browns? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's unexpected. All right, let's find. I wonder if uh, I wonder if like like anyone has ever if if Huffman's ever studied like how well his classes do in a good year for the Browns and in a bad year for the Browns <laughs> because they get quizzes you get quizzes apparently when the Browns lose so you know maybe maybe there's better programmers developed when the Browns have a bad season, you know. I don't think most programmers care. <laughs> well, most programmers don't care, but if they get additional quizzes, maybe that, that, well, that's, that's true. yeah, maybe that, that yeah. teaches them. All right, so let's go under file, new, website. I'm going to create an empty website. I'm going to use C sharp. I'm going to put it on the desktop and call it validation. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, we can. We'll, 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 we can. We'll, we'll review that right now because that, that's a good point. All right, let me go and make a form. Put on the form the text box, a button, and a label. <coughs> now, what this is going to do is this is going to square whatever number they put in. All right, so we'll take it and multiply it by itself and give me an answer. So if I type in two, it'll give me four, and so on. I have just some dumb code that we can try, but it's not dumb code because I want it to be able to fail. So, for example, if someone puts in something goofy or doesn't put any number in, I want to get an actual blow up. All right. <clears throat> okay. So I'm going to put my required field validator. Let's let's review the different validators. A compare validator is used to do what? It can be used to compare two things. So again. Starting date and ending date. <clears throat> Let's say I was doing a search of newspaper articles. I would want to search everything within the month of June, let's say. So I'd say between June 1st, 2014, June 30th, 2014. For that search to work, the second date would have to be after the first date or, or equal. All right. So I could put a compare validation to make sure that the second date was greater than or equal to the first date. All right. Um, if I do, if I enter passwords, you know, when you type in, if you're creating a new account, you type in a password, then it says retype your password. All right, well, then field A would have to match field B. All right, so I could put a control validator to say this guy has to match that guy. Here's a little bit of a twist. You can also use compare validator to do a data type check. <coughs> So if I want to compare to make sure that a field is a date or a field is an integer, that's also one of the options with this. Custom validator is where there's certain validation there, but it's a none of the above. All right. Uh, with the custom validator, you have to write your own JavaScript to do the validation. <coughs> That would be if you had some weird validation rule that, I don't know, maybe looked at, I don't know, some weird combination of things and nothing that fit any of the other categories. And the other categories are pretty versatile. So they handle most of the validation, but the custom validator is sort of the, well, none of the other ones really fit, so I'm going to write my own. The range validator is to make sure that a field is within two different values. So if there was if I had a, a time card field and it said how many hours did you work today? And the answer would have to be between zero and twenty-four. Alright, I couldn't put in twenty-eight hours. Alright, I couldn't put negative two hours. So I would put a rain validator to say that the value of a certain text box has to be between zero and twenty-four. A regular expression validator is where the data in the control fits some pattern. For example, a social security number. Everyone's social security number is three digits, a dash, two digits, a dash, four digits. That's everyone's social security number. An email address follows a certain pattern. Everyone's email address is something at something dot something. All right, now the details of what those somethings are 
It can be different in many cases, but we know for sure that that's what a valid email address is, something at something dot something. So regular expression allows you to define a pattern and specify that the data that you enter in the control has to match that pattern. Phone numbers, another example. Standard phone number within the United States would be, you know, area code, um, three digits, four digits. Now, those are sort of the <coughs> those are sort of the standard things that you have um, regular expressions for. You can also make your own. For example, you may work for a company whose part numbers are all three letters followed by four numbers. Every single part number fits that pattern. Well, you could you could write your own regular expression to validate that. And then finally, a validation summary is not really a validator. It's simply a, a different way to display your validation messages. We might look at that later on. The most confusing one of these, and the one that I don't think we've used, is a regular expression validator. So let's use that one. All right, good a one as any. I'll put that up here. And... I'll validate for an email. Must enter a valid email. What that or regular, you said regular expression? Like regular Thank you. They both started with ours, and it was close enough for me. <laughs> Must enter a valid email address. Now then I have to put with all of these there's a control to validate that is who you're putting this validation on and it's pretty easy in this case I only have a text box and with regular expression there is the validation expression. This is where I specify the pattern um, that, that, the, that the, the, the field has to match. And if I hit the three dots, I'll see a list of Is that a French phone number. French phone number. Nice. It's like an American phone number, but there's lit in front of it. <laughs> so like lit four four zero. You it's know. Smoking. It's stealing my Android joke. It's stealing your Android joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. All right. A URL is another good example. Um, we're gonna pick email address if we can find it. I thought it was there, right? Internet email address. And believe it or not, that's a regular expression to do that. Gee, I'm kind of glad we don't have to write this one and it's predefined. Regular expressions, by the way, is not strictly an ASP.NET thing. You use regular expressions, I don't know if they were first done in Unix or, or what, but you can use regular expressions in a lot of different contexts. All right. So, I want to click that. And now, I'm going to do the code behind. And double click that. And I'm going to put code in the code behind that says label1.text equals text box 1.text. And I'm going to concatenate onto that is a valid email. All right. Now, how is this going to work? Well, since I have not done anything weird with JavaScript validation, this code will not be reached if the validation is false. So if I do not enter a valid email address in, this code won't be reached. All right. So I run this, I close out of it, because who knows where any of the settings are in Internet Explorer, so I'm going to run this in Chrome instead. It's a nice thing about this is it's easy to go and test your 
test your code in multiple browsers. But I'm going to run it in Chrome. And when it comes up, if I put garbage in, I forgot to put in that little snippet of code in my config file. That's going to burn me every single time this semester. And I never remember what it is. So I always have to look it up. I need something. That's that's pretty clear. All right. This is what I need to copy the validation settings. web config. Alright, now when I go and run it, if I put garbage in here, boom, immediately I get the error. And if I put in a valid email address, I get the message from the server. Alright, so we see how that works. Either I get the, the message um, the client side message or I get the server side message. Now, let's go in and let's disable JavaScript. Now, let's hope I remember how to do that in Chrome. <coughs> All right, settings. Oh, I'm almost sure you can. I just don't remember how. Is there a settings open? There you go. allows you to turn it off or turn off, go to settings, show advanced settings, privacy. Here we go somewhere. Ah, do not allow any site to run JavaScript. what I get. I get the server validation error. I get the server error, or I'm sorry, I get a, the, the validation control say, error saying that I must enter a valid email. I also get a message saying it's a valid email address. Why is that? Well, because when JavaScript was not enabled, I'm, I'm sorry, when JavaScript was, was enabled, when it was not disabled, this line of code was never reached if there was an error, a validation error, right? Why? Because the validation error was done on the client side, and it kept the form from submitting. So, the only time it made it to this event is when it passed validation. All right, because if it didn't pass validation, it didn't submit the form. If it didn't submit the form, you won't get this message. 
now I have disabled JavaScript. Okay? So I've disabled JavaScript. So what does that mean? What that means is the validation is not going to fire off on the client side. The validation, however, will fire off on the server side. However, there's nothing keeping that code from executing. So the validation's firing off, and that code is firing off. What we really want to do is we want to keep that code from firing off if the form is not valid. So how are we going to do that? Like an if statement? Okay, it will be an if statement. Kind of say like is valid? Yes. There actually is a property of the page called is valid which which checks to see if it has passed all of the validation controls. So now, if we go and run it, and I put garbage in here, I only get the one message. Why? Because I've put in code that prevents this from running if there's validation errors. So, I could have saved a half hour of time by simply saying, put if is valid in front of every single one of your event handlers at the beginning. All right? But I think it's important to understand how this stuff works. So, in my mind, it's worth the half hour to go over the more details. So, we put this in. If JavaScript's enabled, this doesn't do any harm, right? Because that if statement will only be reached when the form is valid. So is valid will always be true, and then I'll go and I'll display the appropriate valid message. How, one second. However, if JavaScript is disabled and the validation runs on the server, then it's going to try and run that button click event even though the form is invalid unless we tell it not to. Yes? Every website should have that, oh, okay. all right? Whether it does or not, probably not, but it should. Okay. It ought to. Those who use ASP.NET will do it this way. Those using PHP will take some other mechanism to do it. Can you blow that up a little bit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I've if is valid, and that goes around my event code. All right. So you could add anything else in there too, like for, for your, any other condition to the if statement. You would just say and whatever you wanted. <coughs> Could, but the way I would see it, the way if I was coding it, I would leave this if statement by itself because this if statement does one thing. It makes sure that the form is okay to process. Once it's okay to process, yeah, I might have other if statements, but conceptually for me, this is like decision number one. Can I even process this data? If so, then I start doing the processing and then I start doing maybe the other if statements. Yes? What is in label1.txt? Label1.txt will be, if the data is valid, it will be the person's email address along with a message saying is a valid email. So I say label1.txt equals the value of the text box plus the message is a valid email address. Right, but currently what is in label... I, I believe I blanked it out, so nothing is in it initially. So shouldn't everything return okay? No. The label's just for the results. 
All right. But you're comparing labels in the text box. No, I'm not comparing. I'm not comparing anything. I'm not comparing a label to anything. In the uh, code, it says label one dot text if that's equal to. Yeah, the that's text. not. That's not a comparison now. That's that, not the user signing. That, that's not, a, it's that's a not an if statement. statement. That's saying take these things, take the value of the text box plus the expression plus is a valid email address and stuff it into label one text. So that's not a comparison. That's an assignment statement. It's saying take this value and put it in this place. What's making sure that it's a valid email? This is. That right there. That plus the fact that I have on the page a regular expression validator. Regular expression validator that is validating to make sure that it's a valid internet email address. What that is valid does is it checks to make sure that every validation control that I have on the page is returning true. It's saying, yep, it's valid. So if I had 15 different validations that is valid variable that I'm testing would only be true if all 15 of the validations were good. If any of the 15 were bad, then is valid would be false, and I wouldn't execute that statement. So what's highlighted there is what? I can't read that. It says internet email address. Remember, with a regular expression validator, there's a certain number of, of predefined ones that are, are typical like phone numbers, postcode, postal codes, um, web page addresses, email addresses. And then you have the capacity to enter your own regular expression if your organization has something specific. Can anyone think of something at LC that you could write a regular expression for? Student ID? Student ID? Like maybe, but you, you might, well maybe, but I think there might be another way to handle that one. Oh. Okay, you could you could you, you could validate that. How would you uh, um, how would you validate um, the student number? What would you do if you were writing validation? Uh, yeah, well, actually not. I have five digits. Well, you could validate. You could do a range validator. Um, you could validate to make sure it's an integer, knowing that you're probably going to have additional validation on the server side to make sure it's a real student number, right? Because you don't know, you know, just because it fits the form, it might not necessarily be a valid um, student so number. Compare it to the database of right. numbers. Right. Right. That would but that would be on the server side. As far as validation controls, you might compare it at the, as an integer. You might test a range of values. You could use you could use uh, regular expressions. Do teachers have five digits, students have seven digits as of right now? No. It's, you, there is one number that you get, and it depends on just where you were assigned sequentially. So, because I attended school here in the, in the uh, what would you say, I guess I'd say late 20th century, all right? Because, yeah, because I attended it then, my faculty ID is, is my student number from back then. Oh, so they've just gone up in increments. So they've just gone up in increments. So if I, if I let's say, if I never went to school here and was hired, and today, I'd have a high student yeah. number, or so high just, ID number. I would just do it so that it was, the range was between how many, what's the minimum it could be, and right. the highest it could be, and then use wild cards in there to... Yeah, so you could, you could do, sure well, you wouldn't even need to do a wild card, right? You, you could just say, let's say the lowest student number is, mine is like, mine is six, seven something. So, assuming that there's people older than me that went here, you could say maybe the student numbers start with 10,000 and they run till 999,999, something like that. There's no wild card specific to uh, numbers in this area. No, but you don't need a wild card. I was, I know, right. I was just wondering if, right. like, because then that would be another way of, if there was, it'd be a valid way of validating, make sure they didn't put A257. Well, if you use a range validator, it will do that as well. That's 
Um, you could write a regular expression for it, though, but that's, that's like the long way around. All right. Verifying that there's, a, there's an EDU, you could probably write uh, a, a uh, regular expression for that. Yeah, you could change the ending of it. You could write a custom. What's another, what's, what, what is a, a really good candidate for regular expressions, though? What is this class that you're in? CISS what? 243. Someone shout out another class that, that they have. Someone shout out the full name of the class. CISS 232. CISS 232. Anyone taking accounting? ACCT 151 or 152. Right. So every course here fits a scheme. All right. There's four letters and there's three numbers. And what's more, if I'm not mistaken, the first of those three digits is either a zero, one, or two. Being a community college, I don't think we have any 300 level classes. Some of the dev ed classes start with a zero, and then the last two, I believe, can be any digit. It's just how it's assigned. So that would be a great candidate for regular expression if we wanted to do that. Now, again, we could validate on the client side that it fit that format. CISS 232, yeah, that's valid. ACCT 151. Now, we could, now something like MLZ 000 would pass the regular expression, or ML, MLFZ 000 would pass the regular expression, but then the server side validation that would look at the database and see is that actually really a course, it would fail there. All right. Um, could you punch in a bogus email address with what you just did? With what? Uh, just supply a, run it and supply a bad email. I just want to. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure what you mean by a bad email. Uh, something that's completely, there's invalid. something in that about the ad. What? Something that's completely invalid. No way. Well, well again, define what you mean by completely invalid. Uh, gibberish. Just X. Putting, Gibberish. All right. That's not a valid email address, right? Correct. And when I click that, it says must enter a valid email. So if you put gibberish at something, then gibberish at huh, gibberish .com. huh. dot wow is a valid email address. Email now, is that. Even though dot wow is not a top level domain, because it could be at some point, and even though huh is probably not a valid email address or a valid domain, and um, believe me, I'm not going to type it in to see what comes up. All right. And even if it was something valid, like lorraineccc.edu, despite there being Many professors here that speak gibberish, there's no one whose name is actually gibberish. So that's not a valid email address. So you have an issue because like, the student email addresses here uh -huh. are whatever at mail.lorraincc.edu. No, that's, not, that's fine. That work? Yep. Uh, oh, okay. There's a okay, it's just a password. I, I was on a site the other day that said my email was not oh, valid. Okay. Mm -hmm. It was. That's every time I typed it in. Because you still have. Right. Um, it, it, it is it is hard to say. Probably had a probably had a bogus validation rule, bogus regular expression, or they, they their algorithm wasn't correct. And that's one good advantage to using regular expressions like this is they're they're kind of tested, right? They're they're kind of tested and they're validated. Any one of you could, I'm confident, if you took long enough time, you could write the code to validate an email. But there's all these little things that you might forget. Like, for example, does it, would every email address end in three characters? No. No. What would be an example of an email address that wouldn't? Out of country. Like Out of country. Out yeah. Be, uh, you know, Mike at bbc.co.uk. Yeah. And there'd be like some dot info, right. So you might think that, well, the last, after the dot, there has to be three characters. Well, wrong. All right. Um, okay. 
So the bottom line, what we've learned from this is wrap all of your event handlers in is valid. And that will ensure that um, if, the, if the validation runs on the server and there's a validation error, that you don't try something illegal. Um, again, keep in mind that even here we're seeing the limits of the validation controls. These are simply looking to see if the form of the data is correct, not is that really an email address. Um, how would you validate if something is a real email address? You have to go to a database. Is there a database of all the valid email addresses? You'd have to send an email. Yeah, you'd have to. In the case of an email, you'd have to send an email to it, and if someone responds to it, then yeah, it's probably valid. You know, it's valid. Um, for other things like credit card, there would be a database that you could go and look up. Or for course numbers here, if I typed in M I K E one one one. It would pass the form of the validation, but if I went in and hit up against LC's database and looked, say, there's no courses MIKE 111. Pardon me? Where it would just send a quick signal to and receive from an email address, like in this case, it could be a form of validation. You know what I mean? If you were to put this in, or it passed our validation, but then a secondary validation could be to send a quick to and get a response from on the server side of the email. Well, you'd have to wait for them to respond. No, you wouldn't have to wait. If you'd set it so that when you create an email address, it has that capability of getting a form of validation to make sure that an email address is a legitimate email address. A, that doesn't happen because other people can't make me send emails. Well, that's right. But if, like, Yahoo, for example, supported that, Yahoo would be able to send If Yahoo supported say, that, that would be known as spammer slash virus heaven, oh, really? right? Because that would allow other people to send emails from your account. That's true. So let's say LorraineCCC.edu supported that. And I could then go in and write code to have dhuffman at LorraineCCC.edu send someone an email, if that were the case. Right, it would be fun. But um, yeah, it wouldn't be a good idea. So. I mean, there's do a. They do that enough already. Yeah, they do that enough through <laughs> through funky means already. But again, that would that would probably be a pretty dangerous thing to to do. And again, you know, if you think about it, w what is this used for? You know, one of the reasons this is used for is, yeah, okay, what you described would check if someone accidentally, like if if I if I hit the wrong, if I, instead of L, I typed in K. I do that a lot with my name, like Zeckers, you know. That would catch that kind of error, because it would say, hey. But, um, a lot of times what, what people will do, you know, I mean, a lot of times that control is in there to, um, you know, keep people from signing someone else to up to a mailing list, for example. If, if I was able to, to go in and put D. Huffman and it was automatically verified, that probably wouldn't be a good idea either. That's why you have to confirm, yeah. right? Because that, that's the only way for sure to know, because there's no database of emails out there for, for all the domains, all right? So the way to do it is to send it an email and ask for a response. And if you look closely at that response, Usually there's some kind of thing on the query string. There's some extra characters there. And that's identifying you, that, that this is a response for you as opposed to a response for someone else that, um, that might be um, registering at the same time. All right. That, that was part one of the lecture, which went longer than I thought, but it's good because I, I, like, I don't like when things seem like magic. You know what I mean? It's like, I think it's important not just to say, well, do this, but to sort of understand it. Because really, if you don't understand the way that the client and the server talk to each other and the way the interchange works, a lot of things are going to seem really mysterious to you and, and are going to be hard to figure. Whereas if you have a grip on that, then, then things should go a lot clearer. What I want to talk to you about now is the difference between 
code that works and good code. All right. What's the difference between code that works and good code? Isn't code that works good code automatically or no? All right. What's the difference between code that works and good code? Okay. Okay. Where you could just stuff like everything up. You know, I mean, you could do a lot of programs. Like that. Okay. So what, what? So what you're saying is, in addition to code working, I think this one here is saying it should also be well written. Right, yeah. All right. So, I I guess if we're going to, I guess we're going to draw a Venn diagram. This isn't really a Venn diagram. It's like this. We have the code universe. We have code that works. budget, I'd have someone edit out that in the, in the video. <laughs> Probably looks more like this. Code that works. Good code. Uh, sort of the academic way to say it is that working is a necessary <coughs> but not sufficient quality of good code. In other words, getting your code to work is like the starting point. It's like not the ending point. Putting it differently, getting your code to work might be C or D level work. All right, if we're going to assign a grade to it. It's not, definitely not A work. And it's probably not even B work. It's not F work, all right? But it's probably C-ish or D-ish work. So, what we want is we want good code in addition to code that works. So, we want it to be good. For it to be good, first it has to work. What are some other characteristics? It doesn't break. It doesn't break. And, and, and one way to say that is fault tolerant. So, for example, you know, code can work provided people remember to always enter an integer in this field. Well, that's not good code, because if someone forgets to enter an integer in the field, it could break. All right? So fault tolerance is one characteristic. And we'll talk about that. Validation helps us make code that's fault tolerant, by the way. Right? If your code blows up when you enter a non-integer, well, don't allow them to enter a non-integer, and you, you handle that fault. What's another condition for good code. It's well written. Well, but, uh, but what makes it well written? Maintainability. All right, maintainability, all right, is a good one. We'll talk about that. And what makes it, what's, what are other aspects that make it well written? Good notes. Good notes and comments. comments are so the interesting thing is, is almost anything you say here falls under the umbrella of maintainability. For example, why are comments such a good thing? Because they help you read the code. Because they help you read the code. So what does that mean? <coughs> makes it easier to maintain the makes it, makes it easier. And what do I mean by maintainability? I mean so going back and making changes to it. Somebody else can pick it up. 
or someone else can go, or even yourself a week after, right? I mean, you know, a lot of times if you two look at later, code, yeah, yeah, not to mention two years later, even even a short period of time. So the comments are good because they allow us to go in and pick it up and get some explanation. And I think we've talked a little bit about this before. All right. What about what about using naming conventions? Giving your fields descriptive that names. That helps with maintainability too, because it makes the code easier to read. Easy to read equals easier to understand what's going on and easier to change. All right. What about breaking things into functions instead of having one giant chunk of code? This is another good programming practice. How does that help maintainability? It helps if you have something wrong in one part of your program, you can kind of think about it better and you just have to fix that one part. Yeah. Well, if things are divided into functions, things are in bite-sized pieces. And you can go in and you can look at and more easily find you know, it's easier to find a problem with, uh, with when you have 10 lines of code that you're looking at or when you have 1,000 lines of code to look at. Well, it's easier to find a problem when you have 10 lines of code. So breaking it up into chunks helps with debugging. What else is breaking it up into chunks help with? Well, unnecessary repeats are... Unnecessary repeats, right? That's another thing. Writing functions, creating functions takes a set of code that we might do over and over again and make sure that it's all that code's only in one spot so it's consistent. And another way to say that is it uh, lends itself to reusability. All right? So uh, code that's reusable is more maintainable. Why is it more maintainable? Well, if something changes or if there's a bug, we only have to change it in one place. All right? I'm going to do just a silly little distance conversion between um, uh, kilometers to miles to feet and all that kind of stuff. Well, that could be a lot of places within an app, right? I have a little fitness app, tracking app that calculates and you have the option to show the, the, the results in either kilometers or, or miles. Every page of that app has code to convert from one to the other, right? Because if I decide, hey, I want to see it in miles, it's going to show on every page, it's going to show it in miles. If I say I want to show it in kilometers, it's going to show it in kilometers. It stores it one way or the other, doesn't matter. But then it has functions to go in and convert it. Now what happens if I get that function wrong? It's wrong everywhere. That's the bad news. The good news is, is that if I correct it, I also correct it everywhere. Now, in the case of converting miles to kilometers and vice versa, that's a calculation that once I get it right, I don't have to worry about. So, in some respects, that might not be the best example here, but it's simple enough, so we'll, we'll make do with it. The bigger problem comes in is when you have a calculation that is apt to change over time. For example, uh, withholding money for paychecks. All right. You know, they change the law all the time about how much taxes withheld. Taxes go up, taxes go down. Um, well, election year they go theoretically, down. yeah, that's true. Election year, election they go year down. Yeah, do do keep in do keep in mind, yeah, that 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 you know, we, here in academia, we discuss the theoretical, not not the, not not only the practical. Uh, in addition, the rules could change. Like they might change the way taxes are calculated for a married couple or a single person, or if you have certain dependents. The point is, is some of that stuff changing is really outside the, the, the realm of the developer. You know, you're not likely to be too successful going down to Washington and picketing the latest Rwanda tax reform saying, hey, I don't know if this favors, you know, if this is a liberal uh, uh, bill or a conservative bill, I don't want to have to change my code, <laughs> you know. So I'm against it, no matter what it does, you know. That's not going to work very well. That's really out of your control. So when I talk about changing a program, bugs is certainly one reason you have to change it. You didn't get it right the first time, right? There's external characteristics that come into play that would require you to change it, like laws or something outside of your environment. 
And then there's basic organizational changes. Like they may change the way at LC that they calculate tuition. They might eliminate, you know, they might, ch they might change it to just have an in-county and an out-of-county rate and forget about the out-of-state rate or whatever. All right? So our aim is to make our code maintainable because we know even if we're perfect, and get the code down, it's something is still liable to change and necessitates changing our code. All right? So we adopt all these practices. Now what I want to do is I want to start by making just a simple calculation, and we'll expand on this, um, to calculate um, and convert kilometers to miles. All right? And, uh, or miles to kilometers, let's say. Which one do I know how to do better? We'll figure it out. All right. Um, okay, so let's let's do that. All right. Then we'll talk about how we can make that code better, and we might expand this and so on. So let's go and let's turn JavaScript back on. Nice thing about these machines is that they do reset. This machine, I'm pretty sure, resets every time. So, um, if I did happen to forget the next reboot, it would correct it. Okay. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to create a new one. Visual C Sharp, empty website, put it on the desktop, I'm going to call it conversion. going to put in the bare bonus code that I could legitimately say works. All right, so I'm going to put text box. I'm going to put a button. And I'm going to put a label. Now, one thing that we didn't talk about, and I, I suppose you could include this as a third factor in making a program that works versus a good one is the usability of it to the users. All right. So, for example, we're going to write code that actually, um, actually um, does a calculation right, but we're not labeling anything. So, poor user has, it knows that they did a calculation, but they have no idea what calculation they did. All right. Well, we could pick and make it more user friendly. We could make it appealing. One thing I emphasize in in the web development class is that. <clears throat> Some of the, the, the graphic design aspect of web pages isn't just about making the page look attractive. It's about making the page more functional. So you can do things with colors and fonts to group things and to set things off and to emphasize different things uh, on the page. And that goes beyond just like, oh, I like how that looks. It's like, oh, it's more functional this way. All right? But we're not going to worry about that right now. I'm going to go in and I'm going to put my code behind. 
I'll eliminate the initial value for the label. Double click on the button. Now, what do I want to do? All right, I want to grab the value from the text box. So I'll say double km double miles km equals text box one All right, that's not correct. Why not? You're trying to stuff what is a string into a double. Now, if I put validation on the text box to make sure I can only enter numbers in, will that fix this error? No, because the, the, the text property of a text box could be any string. The fact that we have validation on it is irrelevant. That validation could get turned off. We could, we could, through our code, turn off the validation. So there could be a string in here. How do we convert it to a double? Uh, yeah. two double or convert that two double. Convert two double. Two double. Two double. Two double. Yep. i got to hit at least some of the right keys for this to work. And put it in parentheses. So what that will do is that will take the value here in the text box, which is text, it will convert it into double, and it will stuff it in there. So this is the one thing I remember that a 10k is 6.2 miles long. So if I take the kilometers times 0.62, I think I got the miles. Then finally, label one, text equals what? Miles. Miles? Can you blow that up a little bit? Yeah. Again, we got the squigglies. What do I need to do? Two strength. Got two strength. Parentheses. And that does just the opposite. Again, it's good that C sharp does that. This is a strongly typed language. So some languages make assumptions for you. And that's not really good. You think they're doing you a favor. For example, in some languages you could assign a string to you could assign, take a double and stuff it in a string, and it sort of figures out what to do, and it does a conversion for you. This C sharp wants to make sure that you're aware of every single conversion that happens, so it doesn't do any, any implicit conversions. You have to deliberately do any conversions. So now we can run this, and I put in... 10K is 6.2 miles. 1K equals 0.62 miles. 5K equals 3.1 miles. And I believe these numbers are all accurate, near, near as I know. Could you uh, throw a format specifier inside those parentheses after the two string to carry it out to uh, three places after the decimal? Yeah, you could. I'm sure there's a property for that. Yeah, I'm sure there's a property for that. <laughs> we could just... Yeah, how you do that, I don't know off the top of my head. But I'm sure you can do some formatting for that. Would that be... Uh, Change that 0.62 to 0.62.
significant digits. So, all right. Okay. All right. Now, fault tolerance. All right. This isn't very fault tolerant, right? Because I'm torn about a negative. Because the negative will give me a correct result. It's if, true. It, it, if, if you go backwards, right? If if you're talking about if you're talking about distance as a vector, yeah, that's true. Then then negative distances are possible, you know, as opposed to a a a, a scalar. If you just want to throw relativity away. You know. <laughs> um, I'm thinking more of the obvious one. How many miles is that? Boom, I get an error. Now, there's a few ways that we can handle this. All right? One of the ways that we've seen, one of the ways we haven't seen. The most basic way to handle it would be by validating to make sure that they put in um, a double. All right? So, let's go and do that, and that will make this fault tolerant. Oops. Again, you could claim that, well, my program works as long as they know, gee, who would be dumb enough to put, you know, <laughs> a, a values in it? It isn't about that. Who ran AFE minus? Yeah it, no it, yeah, it isn't about that. It's well, about... Could put in 10. Someone could type 10. Sure. All right. There, there's, again, it's not your job to judge the user. All right. It's your job to write tight code. So... I could go in and oh, go here. I will put a required field validator and I'll put a I'll yeah, put a compare validator. I'm doing this out of context. I'm not really saying why I'm converting these. But if you think in terms of, um, of you know, are you talking about the distance someone runs? Are you talking about the distance between planets? Are you talking about, for all these things, I'm, just, I'm going to put the least restrictive validation. So I'm going to just make sure that they enter in a number. All right. So I'm going to make a required field. And I'll put for the error message there. must enter a value. What else do I have to set for this validator? The control. The control to validate. Every validator you have to say what you're validating. All right. And then to compare validator, I'm going to put my error message that says control to validate, text box one, error message, must enter a number. What are the two other things that I have to put in here? Positive. Well, uh, again, I, we're going we're gonna to leave the possibility of it being a negative. Yeah. Uh, it, it, if I was going to redo this, maybe I would, but we're this far along. We're, we're going we're gonna to include that. Under the required field validator, I changed two things. I gave an error message, and I also changed, I didn't change, but I set which control is validating. For every validator control, you have to define what it is you're validating. Now, for the compare validator, I've put in my error message. I've put in my control to validate. What else do I have to put in? put a data type in to say, yeah, we're dealing with doubles here. And I also have to put in the operator that I'm doing a data type check. And the type is a double. 
So now we go and run this. We get the message it must enter a uh, sad, sad, sad. I put nothing in, I get the must enter a value. I'm just looking for it to say decimal under there. How come it doesn't let you pick a decimal? It's just like a double or a A double is a, a double is a decimal. So it's the same. Yeah. Okay. A decimal setting it to decimal means it only wants a decimal, right? A double will allow a whole number and a decimal number combined. Right? Don't know. I've, I've never found it useful. Yeah, I, I always do use double. Yeah. So. Double and in. Double and in, right. All right. So, again, do keep in mind I am being a little sloppy here. I haven't done really anything for the way the user interface looks. We might improve it just a little bit just to give lip service there, but I wanted to get to this point of the example. Um, I also was bad about naming my fields. I called it text box 1. All right, I probably should go and change that, too. All right, so this is our starting point. All right, and we have code that works. The UI isn't very good. All right, it is fault tolerant now. Not good because we didn't use descriptive variable names. We didn't comment anything, so that's bad. What else is bad? about this code. I have all my calculations in the button click event. And what's wrong with that? If I want to do this calculation anywhere else, it's stuck to this button. It's, it's bound, it's tethered, uh, it's coupled. That's the word I'm looking for. There's tight coupling here. In other words, that code lives on that button. I want another page that doesn't have a button, but has a drop down where I pick, here's a list of races that you could enter in, and oh yeah, here's the number of miles associated with them. All right, I have to duplicate this code. Even if I did it on the same page, I'd have to duplicate this code. So, this isn't good because we have too tight of coupling between our event handler and our code that actually does the, the work, the, 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 the business role. All right? To kind of go the full loop here, the other thing I would want to put in is if is valid, again, just in case some wise guy has JavaScript disabled. <coughs> All right. That way, if the validation doesn't fire off on the client side, it will fire off on the server side, and I'll keep that code from happening. Why do I want to keep the? Why is it especially important to keep the code from happening here? Because I'm depending on the fact that that text box has been validated, and we'll we'll do this next time, but. If we didn't have this as valid code and we disabled JavaScript, this line would blow up, right? Because if we would try to convert Fred to a double, it would blow up, all right? Whereas now we've made it so this code only gets hit, even if JavaScript is disabled, it only gets hit if the form is valid. So we've covered that possibility. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate this out further and further. We're going to take and we're going to make so that this code is not so tightly coupled to the event handler. In general, the event handler is sort of um, a boss function. All right? Bosses, as we all know, don't do any work themselves. Bosses simply point and tell other people to do stuff. Delegate. All right. Pardon me? Delegate. Delegate. Exactly. That's actually, that's actually a word that's used a lot of times in object-oriented context. So, we want this not to do the work itself. All right, this, is, you know, this is not a good programming practice. We want this to call other pieces of code that are going to do the work for it. So that's what we'll do um, next time. All right, questions? Pardon me?
Right, so here it is. Just a fan part. Oh, here it is, a fan part of class. Oh my god, I almost forgot. I have an appointment coming up. It is time to experiment. So go to the place where the computers are. That might be a duplicate from last time. I don't know. Close to it. I'll put both these examples up on Angel. As long as you're aware to do it for future reference. Yeah. I knew what it was. I was wanting to say, you know, it said what it was. I just right. Right. Where I need to get. Well, I could, uh, I'll come take a look at it. Thanks. 